Charles Alfred Walton. He was a father, a husband, an electronics engineer, owner of over 52 patents, and the inventor of RFID. He was also a philanthropist, environmental activist, a peace ambassador, community participant, and believed in fitness. He was also a world traveler and dancer. Walton had a rich career as an electronics engineer and philanthropist. A 2004 article in the San Jose Mercury News described him as one of Silicon Valley's unsung inventors and brilliant so far ahead of his time. He is best known for his pioneering patents with radio frequency identification called RFID in the 1970s and 1980s when he explored this. Walton was one of the first engineers in the field of radio frequency identification. The first patent to use the abbreviation RFID was issued to Walton in 1983 and the first application of RFID technology was on door locks. As a father and a husband and one of the pioneers of Silicon Valley itself, he was also a philanthropist concerned about the human condition. He always spent his attention on questions like the causes of war and what's wrong with the American legal system. He was the right person to attack these weighty issues. As an outside of the box and creative individual, when he turned to these social problems, he found the ability to try and solve any problem, humanitarian or technical, with the same set of successful critical thinking he used to approach everything. As his portfolio of over 50 plus patents grew, he was able to capitalize on what would be one of his first inventions, RFID, a keyless door entry system that used one of the earliest forms of RFID technology, and the royalties from those provided financial security and garnered him considerable recognition, including the Founders Medal from SOLE, the International Society of Logistics. Charles found himself in this position to challenge issues beyond technical problems. He used the same sort of analytical, investigative, inquiring and systematic skill sets he used to solve everyday electronics challenges. He said, In the middle part of my life, I had to give priority, of course, to earning a living and being a good parent. In the latter part of my life, once I had some income, I found it very satisfying to learn how government works and to try and solve humanitarian problems and inequalities. Charles Walton was born on December 11, 1921, the firstborn son of Charles Dodson Walton and Clara Ledger Walton. He had his mother and father, and they emigrated here from England to escape World War I. Walton history dates back to Charles Dickens, the historical writer from his mother's side in England. He was also affectionately known as Chappie and came to the U.S. with his family as a young child at the age of two and was raised in Cumberland, Maryland and Scarsdale and Pleasantville, New York. He lived in Cumberland, Maryland with his mother and father until the age of 18 and then moved with his family to Westchester County, Pleasantville, New York. Chappie's father, Charles Walton, was a plant manager of Selenese Corporation that made parachutes and nylon for World War I. Charles had two brothers, the second born was named Derek, and Stanley was born in 1931. His brother Derek went off on to develop the Iowa Education and IQ tests used throughout the 1950s and 1970s and are still used today. Disappointingly, Derek passed away at the age of 30 years old as one of the last remaining cases of polio in the United States right before the cure and inoculation were developed. Charles' youngest brother Stanley went on to serve in the Army branch of the military in the Korean War. His two younger brothers, Derek and Stanley, both predeceased him. Charles Walton honored the memory of his parents and his brothers by endowing Redwood Groves and Big Basin State Park in California through the Sempervirens Foundation and also was the largest single donator and built the Walton Lighthouse in the Santa Cruz Harbor as the jewel of Santa Cruz and surrounding areas. Charles attended boys' school, and he was educated at George School, a Quaker school in Newton, Pennsylvania, which he always credited for encouraging his lifelong dedication to the cause of peace. 
Charles became a U.S. citizen in 1944 while serving in the U.S. Army Signal Corps in World War II. He earned a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering at Cornell University in New York in 1943. College life, a young man, and his beginning career. And after the war, he found several years of employment as an engineer in Maryland and New York. He earned a Master of Science degree from Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey in 1950. Charles' first full-time work experience was for Westinghouse Corporation in Baltimore, Maryland, where he received engineer training and worked for the Austin Company Special Devices Division and held the title of Project Engineer in Manhattan, where he met his first wife, Helene Thompson. They had three beautiful children. The firstborn was Christopher Walton, and then followed Jonathan Walton and Ann Walton. They took many family trips to exotic and fun places around the world. And Chris always commented that he remembered his dad always took time to play with him. He was a great father. He accepted a position with IBM in 1952 as an advisory engineer. He lived in Vestal and Owego, and he was one of the first and most successful inventors of RFID. While working for IBM, he and his family were moved and transferred to San Jose in 1960, and he settled with his family in the adjacent town of Los Gatos. He bought a beautiful home on Overlook Road which twists and turns all the way up the mountain and overlooks all of San Jose and Silicon Valley. Nestled high in the hills above San Jose, his home offered the ideal environment for a creative mind. A koi pond with an underwater view, a model train landscape that descended from the ceiling at the touch of a button, and of course, a laboratory where he spent most of his entire lifetime thinking inventing and looking for solutions. Those activities occupied him every day. Some of his neighbors were astronauts, senators, and one of them was even the man who invented the pet rock. I remember visiting Charlie and his family many times as a kid in my teens, and for weddings and special family events, I was always amazed at the location and the exciting things to explore from the koi pond that you could literally walk underneath the water and view the fish through the glass. It was like an underwater zoo. Of course, walking to the crow's nest up the side of the roof to find even better views that stretched from San Jose to San Francisco Valley. Charles left IBM to pursue his own desires after multiple patents in his name. At that time, he decided to branch off on his own to make his own contributions to technology with his own ideas and started filing his own patents that began his thrust into RFID. He worked in new product development for IBM for 20 years before founding his own company, Proximity Devices, in 1972. This was based on his patents and radio frequency identification. He was considered the father of RFID with over 52 patents in this field of technology. He was a pioneer. In fact, this was the first patent to use the abbreviation RFID issued to Charles in 1983. As the first application of RFID technology was on door locks, he started his own company, Proximity Devices, and was merged with Schlage Lock, and Charles became vice president of Schlage Electronics in 1974. The company licensed his technology to build their own line of security products and door locks. Later, he was then president and founder of Sealox Corporation and continued his research. He later retired as president of Walton Electronics and dedicated his life to independent research and development in 1982. He continued to modify his inventions and file patents well into his 80s. The keyless system today, used on numerous doors and parking lots, are direct descendants of Charlie's inventions. One of my fondest memories was Uncle Charlie visiting upstate New York in Endicott, where I lived with my father, his brother Stanley, who also worked at IBM. And my Uncle Charlie showed us his prototype. I was 14 years old, 
After finishing an electronics convention in New York City, Uncle Charlie brought in his lock model shaped like a door, and we locked and unlocked the model over and over again in our living room. Although Charles' patents on RFID technology expired long ago, RFID tags are still used in the hundreds of billions to track warehouse goods as a substitute for barcode identification and in many, many other applications. They are used by companies and organizations such as Walmart, the Defense Department, to identify pets and reunite them with their owners, in bracelets, at amusement parks and museums, and in airports, shipping containers, and automobiles. Every time you open a hotel door with a key card near the lock, it's a derivation of the original work by Charles Walton. It replaces physical metal keys, magnetic strips, and is used in all kinds of devices where a key is not secure enough and the technology can provide intelligent data to another device. RFID stands for Radio Frequency Identification. It is a technology that enables not only the contactless identification of objects, but also data exchange. An RFID tag or transponder contains the current workpiece data that can be updated during the ongoing production process and accompanies the workpiece from the beginning of the production to delivery. This data could include part number, material name, etc. An RFID read-write device has access to the transponder data and forwards it to a PLC or simultaneously to a host computer. Each transponder has its own RFID number. This allows for flexible activities during the production process. Yes, even a production size of one is possible. RFID is one of the important enablers for smart factory here you see the basic components of a typical RFID system. The RFID reader sends a constant radio wave via an antenna. The tag, also called a transponder, receives this signal and responds with its own radio signal containing the information stored in its memory. The reader decodes this information and passes it on further, typically, to a host computer. My name is Zach Phillips with AtlasRFIDStore.com and I'm going to talk about what RFID means and how it is being used. RFID stands for Radio Frequency Identification. Radio Frequency Identification is a technology that allows almost any object to be wirelessly identified using data transmitted via radio waves. RFID technology is similar to barcodes but with a few major advantages. Hundreds of tags can be read in seconds. Line of sight is not needed to read RFID tags. RFID tags can be very durable. RFID tags can hold more data than other types of tags or labels. Read range for an RFID system can be controlled as needed from zero up to 150 meters. Tags can be encrypted or locked for security. Tag memory can be rewritten and reused. And lastly, RFID systems vary in cost depending on functionality. If you have ever used an access card or fob to get into a building, pass through an automated toll collection system on a highway, used a remote control to open a garage door, or used a reusable phone-based transit pass, you have used RFID. RFID is used in a wide range of applications, including building access control, vehicle tolling, timing for races like marathons and triathlons, tracking high value assets, checking media in and out of libraries, tracking attendees at trade shows, concerts, and events, and tracking inventory in industries like retail, healthcare, and construction. Thanks for watching this video about RFID and how it is used. For more information on radio frequency identification and how it is being used all over the world, check out our blog or our RFID resources page. And as always, if you have any questions at all, please send us an email or give us a call.
In the words of a colleague, it was Charles Walton who saw the possibilities of RFID and who first brought it all to practical and profitable fruition. I still have one of the original Schlage key cards developed by my uncle, and it sits on my desk a reminder of the brilliance and success of Uncle Charlie, this family, and the wonderful contributions to life that he has made and allowed us to make. Charlie, my uncle, and the love of science and seeing his success promoted me to pursue my own electronics and patent dreams, which ended up with me receiving multiple patents, trademarks, and personal success. I even remember calling up Charlie from time to time, asking about his ideas and what my next steps might be. A 2004 article in the San Jose Mercury News described him as one of Silicon Valley's unsung heroes. In 2005, Charles received the Founders Medal, the highest award made to the International Society of Logistics. In 2006, he was nominated for the Lemelson MIT Program Lifetime Achievement Award in recognition of more than 50 patents. He was invited to speak at innumerable conferences, panel discussions, lecture series, and other symposia. He earned a standing ovation when he spoke as a distinguished alumni at George School in 2007. Charles not only had a strong presence and professional reputation in electronics, but he was not just respected for his achievements in this area. There were many other successful endeavors far outside the science of RFID. During his IBM career, Charles had several significant achievements at IBM. One of his key pieces of work is contained in every modern hard disk drive. The first stage transistor invented by Charles in 1969, the principles of which were published in the May 1971 IEEE Solid State Journal. The invention and prototype development of an extra low noise transistor amplifier. This special transistor has ultra low noise and low input impedance. Charles was the first in IBM to use the field effect transistor for analog voltage switching, now widely used. Prior to this development, it was feared that the disk drive memory capacity and retrieval speed limitations were being reached, owing to inherent noise limits in the first stage of the data signal amplification. The low noise amplifying device is manufactured in conjunction with the thin film reading heads. It's a necessary component of the amazing extension of the capacity of disk memories in recent years. Also, the widely used single sector disks used head positioning control first disclosed by Charles in 1968. Most of his time with IBM was spent in the field of applications of computers to process control, a field which IBM moved to Boca Raton. Charles was the fifth founder of Celox Corporation, which makes a later and substantially different form of proximity ID card. Celox was sold in 1985 to the Checkpoint Company of New Jersey, who now makes this card an associated system under the trade name Mirage. After Celox, Charles worked in his home laboratory for some years, applying proximity principles to vehicle identification. Some of this vehicle ID systems were also sold. His system favors roadbed mounting, whereas the heavy competition from former aerospace corporations and microwave specialists have favored the roadside mountings and toll collection booths. In the future, though, when toll booths for ordinary roads may not exist, Charles' roadbed mounting technology might come back into the picture. Other contributions outside of electronics include another creative invention, which is a lead-lined hat to be worn during dental x-rays. The brain is thus protected from stray radiation, just as it's common to put on a protective lead apron to protect the reproductive organs during x-rays. Charles felt this contribution was important to be used widely. He also contributed to the knee restraint chair, which is quite restful for programmers and desk workers. Related to this is a fully programmable electronic executive chair in which the chair surface can be electronically moved to personalize and memorize positions for various functions such as desk work, conversation, reading, napping, and even exercising. These ideas have yet become popular but have inspired many other designs of ergonomic safe desk products. In 1972, Charles appeared on national television on What's My Line, 
a popular TV show where he demonstrated his electronic proximity card access control system. Amazingly, guest Lucy Arnaz was the only one that guessed what his profession was and his invention. Charles also worked on two books. One is titled Legal Client Bill of Rights concerning how clients can remedy problems introduced by the practice of law today. The second book is titled The Space Before Your Face, which was a popular children's book illuminating all the various activities and phenomena which go unseen in the space before one's eyes, such as gravity, tidal effects, compass magnetism, radio, television, light waves, navigation aids, cosmic rays, neutrinos, and cosmic background communications and interference. Charles Walton also loved activities like tennis, and he was the singles champion of Owego, New York in the years of 1955 and 1956, moving on to being the tennis champion of the IBM Mohansic Lab in Westchester for the years of 1958 and 1959. He continued when he moved to California and played in many clubs and tournaments. Through the late 1990s, his favorite exercise was racquetball, usually played at the Los Gatos Athletic Club. Played elsewhere on occasion, particularly when playing one of his opponents, Senator John Vasconcelos. Charles even invented an improvement for racquetball in which a mirror on the front wall provides the players information as to the location of their opponent. This was extended to one-way viewing mirrors on several walls, allowing a greater audience viewing of the court action. Activism, Community, Social Activity, and Philanthropy Charles had a strong social conscience and was equally proud of his work as a peace advocate, a philosopher, political activist, and writer. On the subject of a 1996 Dewar's profile in the San Jose Mercury News, his many letters to the editor earned him the San Jose Mercury Silver Pen Award and a highlighted box in Scientific American in January 2000. He was a... He was a board member of the Collins Foundation, the San Jose Peace Center in 1990, board member of the Committee for the Green Foothills Life Member, Sierra Club, president of the West Valley Democratic Club, chairman of the Overlook Road Maintenance Association. To encourage young people and get them involved in thinking about remedies to global problems, he founded and supported the Walton Peace Essay Challenge Contest for high school students in Santa Clara County, California. The contest was conducted annually for a full 20 years. Long intrigued with the notion of motivating students to think ahead and think critically about problems of the world, Charles sponsored the challenge. The essay contest was open to high school and preparatory school students in the San Francisco Bay Area and asked entrants to think of the causes and costs of war and to propose solutions to the seemingly intractable problems of yesterday and today. Charles was concerned through his entire lifetime of the terrible abuses of human beings that occur throughout the world, some in the United States but particularly in Central American countries where the U.S. has much influence. This is why Charles initiated the annual Walton Peace Essay Challenge and set up a series of prizes and scholarships. The thrust has been to encourage good thinking among high school students as to how the world can reduce armed conflict and violence in the world. Charles was appalled at the waste of energy that went into arguments while funds were denied to those who wished to remedy injustice in the world. Whenever he heard of a problem, say with schoolroom class size or children suffering because their parents were below the poverty line, or a homeless person that could not take a shower, he would remark that one less battleship, one less overseas base, one less bomber, and countless of hundreds of people could be helped out of their misery. Such help were more than pay for itself over the life of an individual who could be switched from being a tax loader to a tax payer and as well have a far more beautiful and satisfactory personal lifetime. The Peace Essay Contest. I personally remember this as I attended some of the celebration dinners and even read and graded some of the students who submitted papers. Winners of the contest would receive scholarships to continue their education. For decades, Charlie was an active participant with the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Los Gatos, where he served in several positions of responsibility. He realized that human rights were important to a peaceful society and was concerned about this end. 
the Committee to Save San Francisco Bay, the Audubon Society, Cousteau Society, and the ACLU. He dedicated a 10-acre tract of land and redwood trees to Semper Verens Fund and to improve the Big Basin Park. He was a pillar within these many organizations and worked closely with the Collins Foundation where he served on the board serving as the background support for the San Jose Peace Center. Born out of his love of sailing and the concern for others, he felt a lighthouse would be a great way to beautify California and Santa Cruz. Charles Walton was the largest single donor to the construction of the lighthouse at the mouth of Santa Cruz Harbor. The Walton Lighthouse, completed in 2001, is named in honor of his father and his brother Derek and his youngest brother Stanley Walton. Its significance to the community and even California is highlighted here in this California advertisement enticing people to move to California. People think Californians live in our own reality. It's our heads in the clouds. Like a bunch of space cadets. Huh? What? Did you see it? People think Californians live in our own reality. It's our heads in the clouds. Like a bunch of space cadets. A highly prized California landmark. Huh? What? I've grown up like, what's my line? Maybe we do live in a fantasy. In our own little bubble. Just hanging out. As if we're not completely down there. But just a bunch of dreamers. No way. We're just like everyone else. You know, average Joes. Start dreaming big at visitcalifornia.com. Charlie had a wonderful, fulfilling life. Both Derek and Stanley predeceased him, but Charles also honored the memory of his parents and brothers by endowing Redwood Groves in Big Basin State Park, California, through the Semper Virens Foundation. Charles was survived by his three children, his son Christopher of Santa Cruz, California, his second son Jonathan of East Lansing, Michigan, and his daughter Anne of Amherst, Massachusetts. He has four grandchildren. In addition to boating and sailing, Charles also loved his peaceful Las Gatas home. He lived there since 1960 at 19115 Overlook Road, Las Gatas. He had a 1,000-foot level view with splendid views of the valley. He referred to his property as halfway to heaven or natural high. Among its add-ons is a view deck topped by a roof peak lookout. The addition includes a dance floor frequently used for square dancing and for Charles' hobby of ballroom dancing. It's a beautiful view over San Jose. Under the dance floor is an apartment housing and Charles' laboratory. He built a koi pond with a unique underwater walk-in viewing area like SeaWorld and built a 16-foot train board in which a dual-track model train system descends from the ceiling to the floor and retracts into the ceiling again with the push of a switch. He also loved playing in the hot tub with his grandsons, social dancing, travel, especially to areas of controversy such as Nicaragua, Russia, and Israel, and the company of friends. He will be missed by his wife, Helene Walton, his children, grandchildren, the engineering community, and his extended family and associates. He will be remembered by everyone, but especially his three children and his four grandchildren, along with my father's side of the family his oldest son, Christopher, from Santa Cruz, California, his son, Jonathan, and his wife, Daphne O'Regan of East Lansing, Michigan, and their sons, Nathaniel Walton and Colin Walton, and his daughter, Anne, and her husband, Mario DePillis Jr. of Amherst, Massachusetts, and their sons, Alexander DePillis and Raphael DePillis. Charles was 89 when he left us, he left us peacefully on Sunday, November 6th at 12.01 p.m. at Our Lady of Fatima Villa in Saratoga, California. I attended the memorial service held at the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Los Gatos, and I remember the room being packed full of people made up of friends, acquaintances, and so many who loved and respected Charlie. The outpouring of stories and tears I saw reminded me of how much he was loved and how much he accomplished in his life, his career, and the impact he had on everyone around him. When I think of Charlie and his legacies he's created here, he's not only a father to three incredibly talented children and four grandchildren, 
I don't just think of his contributions to science and technology, the lighthouse, the Walton Peace Essay Contest, his affecting of social and political change, the Redwood Forest dedications and other generous projects, but how he influenced each one of us and how he lives on in each of us, not just through his children and family, but neighbors, parishioners, maybe as a mentor. None of it's gone. It's still here. He's still here. The essence of Charlie is in every inventor, every father. Parts of Charlie live on in each of us in our generations, everyone he touched and influenced, directly and indirectly. I not only cherish Charlie for the things he brought into my life, but long after the patents expire, we expire, even the lighthouse in three or four hundred years expires, feelings for him and the things he accomplished won't fade. I'll miss talking to Charlie, but everything else, all his ideas, what he stood for, his contributions, and how he influenced each of us stays here forever. Thank you, Charlie. This is a portion of a voicemail message that Charlie left me when he was inviting me to the Lighthouse dedication. <laughs> 